and the movement continues on. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's incredible how what God started so long ago and what Jesus then accomplished on the cross, the resurrection, that that movement continues on today. I wonder, how many of y'all in high school um, were in sports? Anybody play sports in high school? How many of you, um, how many played football? Some of you guys played football. Okay. Uh, any soccer players? Let's go. All right. The great sport of soccer, All right? Football. All right. But hey, those of y'all that were in, in um, high school sports and, and maybe basketball was king when I, in North Carolina growing up, but um, I, played, I played soccer. I played football up to a point until I realized I was too small and I was not very strong. And so that, you know, I was just like, I can't do this. So I, I started playing soccer. And the thing, what happened my senior year, we went to the state championship game. And um, and our our band, everybody jumped on board with us, right? Everybody on the bandwagon. Where it was formerly like all about football outside. But if you guys played football, you know this is true. Like what happens when the drum line comes out, when the band shows up, you know, they get it, then you're like, whoo! You know, like you thought you were pretty hyped, and now you're like, man, I, I could you start running through walls and whatnot, or, or like me, slam into a wall and really get hurt. But you could, you know, you just really get excited. And and we had this cheer that, that we would do, it's kind of a song, uh, and it, it went like this: it went, Stop looking, listen, here come the mighty eagles. We were the East Mecklenburg. Eagles and stop looking, listen, here come the mighty eagle. And so we wanted everybody to stop because we're coming out. We wanted to look, look at us because we're about to do something. Listen, because here we go. And today, what I want to do, I want us all right here in the moment, all right, right in the moment today, I want us to stop. I want us to stop. Okay, you're chilling, you stop, but I want you to focus, I want you to look, all right, and then we're going to listen. We're listening to the Spirit of God speak to us. Today, through his word, don't miss this. This happens every time we open his word. It is alive. So what we're doing now, the spirit of God is going to speak to you. Because we're going to talk about the plan of the church. We're going to talk about God's plan for each one of us. And the plan happens to be, as we'll see in the text, stop, look, and listen. We've made being a Christian so complicated. This is what God's doing in my heart these days. It's just, I'm not going to say it's simple, but it really is clear. And we've made it so complicated. We've been talking about what it means to be a disciple. And so you can go ahead and turn to the book of Acts. Once you do that, turn to the book of Acts. You might know the book of Acts is a two-volume set. Uh, Luke, Dr. Luke writes the first book, which was what? Luke. Yeah, I just seen him. You are with me. Luke. And then he wrote the book of Acts. Last week, we noted that at the beginning of the book of Acts, Acts 1-1, okay, he says, hey, first, Theophilus, you all and us, I wrote about what Jesus began to do. I told you all that he began to do and teach. Jesus just started what he began to do, and then the resurrection takes place. He's ascended, we see in in chapter 1, and he just began what is now going on right now. The whole kind of theme or driving force behind this whole series is post-pandemic. Many of you are new. I've met so many new people in these days, finally watching us online, now coming to church, and I'm meeting people personally. Many of us are new. This is a great series for you to be here. If you're brand new today, this is a great day to be here because we're talking about what are we doing here as a church. We thought, let's get our feet firmly planted on the ground as we're coming out, we pray, out of this pandemic, back to life as it is, and what does that mean for us? How are we not going to go back to who we are? Let's go way back. Let's go back, all the way back, to the book of Acts. So we're looking at the early part of the book of Acts, all right? And we're going to be in just a moment. We're going to be in chapter 3. And I'll get us there, but I'm going to set this up a little bit. Um, Last week, I noted um, that it was on Easter week. It was Monday of Easter week. Gallup poll came out with a recent poll they've done since 1937. And they noted that that membership, those in America who claim membership in a church, has dropped below 50% for the first time ever. 47%. First time they've, they've been doing this for decades. Forever, it was running right along in my lifetime. Um, all, all through decades, it was right at 70 75%. And then came the new millennium. Some of you were born right around the turn of the millennium, about you know, 21, 22 years ago. And, 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 and what happened was then, bam, there's this dramatic decline. I mean, researchers would call this like an anomaly, like dramatic shift and decline. And so we ask the question, and if y'all can just geek out with me for a moment, this is stuff I think about all the time, like, why is this? What can we do to turn the tide? 
And all of us should be thinking about this. And what happens, though, if we're not careful, we see people in the media, whatever else, they're, they're going, I tell you what's wrong. What's, what's all those lost people is what's wrong. All the non-Christians. We used to have more, you know, seemingly more Christian people. And that's the problem is all those people that don't go to church. That's the problem. Or I'm a, I'm a Democrat. It's the Republicans that are the problem. And it's, I'm, I'm a Republican. It's the Democrats that are the problem. It's this secular mindset. You know, it's what, it's, it's, then it becomes us against them. And Jesus, that's not how we are to live our lives. We are to be for them, right? We're to be loving the world to him in this upside down kingdom. Because what can happen, we can think, well, it, you know, they're the problem. And my point is, in all of this, is that I believe we don't have a societal problem. We have that. But I could argue that we have lost our focus. Our identity as, as a church, capital C, has been hijacked. And now what's happening is we have not so much a, a, a societal problem. We've got a discipleship problem. That's our problem. And I've said it before, those of us who are throwing rocks at that, you know, like we've always done, that, those young kids, the millennials, you know, or Gen Z, you know, it's all about that they just don't know the Lord or whatever. I mean, we've always heard this. And I would say this respectfully, if you're not investing, if you're not discipling someone in the next generation, then, then don't throw shade at them, okay? Don't even talk about it. Because we have a discipleship problem. And so I'm calling us back. We're a great commissioned church. And the Lord's called us to be this kind of church. It was John Wesley who said this. The church changes the world not by making converts, but by making disciples. We've talked about this recently. The word Christian, which we used to designate us, right? If you're a Christ follower, if you're a Christian, uh, is the word, that word used twice in the New Testament. The word disciple is used 261 times. This is the word Jesus uses. And what Wesley is getting at, the founder of Methodism, is he didn't call us just to say, I, I agree with this. Jesus died on the cross for me. I get to go to heaven. I'm in. I'm a Christian. He says, no. You can't, in fact, I would argue, you cannot be a Christian if you're not a disciple. The call is to discipleship. The call is to respond to, yes, what Christ has done for us on the cross and say, I believe by faith I receive his grace, now forgiven, new identity, and my response, watch this, is to become a disciple. That's the call, to be an apprentice of our rabbi Jesus. And too often I think we, we think that the church is like this machine, and we say the church makes disciples. See, don't miss this as I talk about this. The church makes disciples. The church is making disciples. Like it's some big machine, like you enter in one end, you do these things, you go to church, you do this, you go to Bible study, you do this, these things, and it spits out disciples on the other end. The church is making disciples. No, you are the church. I am the church. We're all disciples, and we are called to make disciples. Watch this. Even the way that we make disciples in the church, and I've been at this for a long time, even the way we, we, we you know, have some process or discipleship pathway, we can, listen, remove Jesus as the rabbi. Are you following Jesus daily? I used to say it this way. If, you, know, you might go to church every week, and not everybody's doing that these days, right? You can go to church every week and not follow Jesus every day. Christian disciple, all in. So if you're hearing me, you're going, Jeff, I'm all in. I mean, I want to, I want to, so what, what do we do here? Listen, here's what Dallas Willard said. Dallas Willard said, what you present as the gospel will determine what you present as discipleship. Most problems in contemporary churches can be explained by the fact that members have never decided to follow Christ. Never really decided to be an apprentice of Jesus, all out, orientation of life, whole life discipleship to follow him every day. Here's what God's stirring in my heart, Okay. This is what God's stirring in my heart these days. And it's a call for me to personal holiness in my life. I mean, like a no tolerance rule to sin. And he's calling all of us to consecrate ourselves, to set ourselves apart, to be obedient to him. This is what it means to be an apprentice. I'm going to be just like my rabbi Jesus. I'm going to keep growing. And it takes time. It takes a lifetime. But every day we're following him, hearing from him, follow, obeying him in his word. 
This is what it means. And he's calling all of us, friends. What our generation needs is a group of people who aren't, you know, fighting whatever political wars or societal wars there are. People who are consecrated, set apart, living different, holy lives before Jesus. Being transformed by him. That's what the world needs. And that's the call on our lives. We need to be discipled out of our sinful patterns. We need to be discipled out of racism, out of nationalism, out of materialism, out of secularism. And we do so as we follow Jesus. And we're in this together, helping each other grow. It's what we do from the platform here, from our pulpits. It's what we do in our connect groups. It's what we do in everything we do, point people to Jesus. And there is good news. He does change lives, as we've heard today. And he's changing yours, and he's changing mine. So clearly, the purpose of the church, all right, is to make disciples. That's it. Are you following your rabbi Jesus? Are you doing something else? So you might be thinking, I'm all in. What's the plan, right? We have a purpose. What is the plan to accomplish the purpose? We find it there comprehensively or collectively. We see it in Acts 1.8, right? You can see it on the screen. I want you to read this with me because we're all in this together, okay? So let's say it out loud. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in, yes, I'm sorry, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. All right, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. Now, we said last week, if you heard me or Travis, we talked about how um, this is, can be a geographical, clearly, right, designation, but it's also those that we know who are in our lives. They may be living under the same roof, people we know well. They're just like us. We're in Jerusalem, and everybody in Jerusalem is just like us. Now, the problem with that is you get in this echo chamber, right? Everybody agrees with me, and I, I must be right about everything. No, you're not. You know, so he says, I want you to go further. We go into Judea. We go to places where people aren't like us. People don't look like us. They have different skin color than us or whatever that might be. They don't think like us. They don't vote like us. They're not like us. And then he says, and I don't want you to stay there either. I want you to go to people you don't yet know. And these are people in our lives. You don't have to go to the ends of the earth. We do that as a church. Praise God as things open up. We were looking at mission possibilities and trips even into South Texas this summer. And we're ready to go because we go. But these people are in our lives right now. And so here's the plan. Why Jerusalem? Because that's where they were, right? So the plan of the church is to start where you are. All right? That's the key today. Look at Acts chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 26. We're not going to bust through all this, but we'll look at the early part especially, okay? First, I want you to see, and here we're going to see it in the text. How do we, what's the plan? Stop, look, and listen. It's that simple. That's what we do. That's how we do this. We need to stop and focus. Look at verse 1. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. This is 3 o'clock, actually. And a man, lame from birth, think about this. He has, from a little toddler... A little boy as a high school age, as a teenager, this man has spent his entire life on the ground. He's never walked. He's there at the temple begging. He's laid out there. People would come and lay him out there daily, and he would be at the beautiful gate and he'd ask for alms. What a sad, sad story. He's become a part of the scenery. He's probably there all the time. People don't even stop. And then look at verse 3. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them to receive alms. They're like, hey, can, can you give me something? He's doing that with everybody going in. Will Peter and John stop and really look and see him? Years ago, I was um, preaching at, at a church, former church, uh, on a Sunday night, and I was talking about the Good Samaritan. And I came up with an idea. I went out uh, in front of the church while people were arriving at the main entrance there, and I, I was dressed up like a homeless man. And I had hair, so he didn't recognize me. And so I was, all, I was all shabby, and I was just a homeless guy out in front of the church. Like, I wonder if anybody's going to help me out. And, and so I was out there for a long time. It's about time to start, and people walking in. I'm, I was getting closer, like, y'all see me, right? Like, I'm out here. I need some help. And then finally, three, no, take note, girls, high school girls, came out. And they, they came out to said, you need something to eat, and we, would you come into church? We're about to start a service, and we'd love for you. You can sit with us. And I was like, hey, girls, I'm your pastor. This is your pastor. Uh, sorry, I'm your pastor. And they're like, oh, my gosh. You know, they just freaked out. And they're like, oh, my gosh. I said, yeah, you're about to blow my cover. Go back in. Y'all are so sweet. Thank you. I'm going to come in. So I was going to go in and preach homeless man. 
and preach, the, you know, really, tell my story as a homeless man. My point is this. Could it be that we are going to church, doing the Christian thing, and not stopping to see people all around us who need the gospel, who need care? Listen, there are all kinds of paralysis. There's physical paralysis. There's emotional paralysis. There's spiritual paralysis. There are those around us, all around us, who are broken. And and broken by sin, yes, since they were born. They might be in our own homes. And God is calling us to stop and really look. Okay? So here's what happens. Of course, you you might know this story. They they will stop. And then look at this. They're going to look. This is verse 4. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said... Now, this is interesting. Look at us. But I, I think what's happening here, this guy's probably so ashamed... He's so uh, beat down, he's not even looking at people. He's like, well, you, you know, I just you give me something. I just need something, please. I need something. And, and, and Peter, I love this. Look at us. Look at, us. Look at me. Look at me. He's going to lock eyes with him because until we see faces, until we really see people, they don't truly exist. Are you truly focused in on people in your life? They may be in your own family, people in your neighborhood, people at work who may look like they got it together. We need to say, look at me. Look at me. To look at someone and to really understand is to be a faithful presence. Focus. Who in your life is God calling you to focus in on right now in these days? Who's he calling you to serve and to minister to? And then look at verse 5. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. They, you know, Money, that's all he knows. He doesn't even know what he needs. Or he doesn't know what they can bring. This is true about everybody we know who doesn't know Christ. We got something better. To bring to them. We need to stop. We need to truly look. Who is God putting in your mind? Look. And we need to listen. All right, as we close. Look at verse 6. Here it says, Peter says to him, I have no silver or gold, but what I can give you, I give to you. I give you the name of Jesus. I say to you, get up, rise up, and walk. Now look, here's what's happening. Many of us need to listen. Here's what it means to be a disciple. A disciple means, Jesus, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. Literally, listen, to be a disciple means that you hear the voice of Jesus. And some of you are like, well, that's kind of freaky. Like, how does that happen? Like, audibly? In his word, daily. Aware and listening to the way of Jesus in your life and to look for people and to listen to what's going on in your life, in the hearts of people in your life these days. For you to be able to say, I hear what the Spirit is saying. I know this person needs the gospel, and I can share it with them. Look at verse 7. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And this is, watch, this is a continuation of Acts 1-1, what Jesus began to do. Now, you might say, well, what about us? Like, I'd love that. That's amazing. You didn't even need therapy. This is incredible. Like this immediately, it says in verse 8, and leaping up, imagine this picture. He stood up and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, immediately, if you're like me, you read that and go, yeah, but miracles, but really? Come on. I'd love to see this. Listen, if you believe that God created all things ex nihilo, out of nothing, you've got to believe in the possibility of miracles. Because God's the one, the Bible says, holds all things together. And what a miracle is, is simply, he, you know, he sustains all things, but he can also just as easily, right, enter into a new pattern that is uncommon in the way that he commonly sustains all things. And so we need to pray for healing. We need to pray for miracles. We need to pray for emotional healing, right? There's all kinds, again, all kinds of paralysis. There's all kinds of miracles that come into the lives of people. You're telling me, listen, tie choice, you think that's a miracle? Only God can do that. That, you could argue that's greater than somebody who was crippled. Now they're walking and don't know Jesus. And their lives are still self-focused, self-centered. God does miracles even today. And he does so, so he points us to the future of what's coming. And that should give us great hope today. In fact, this was a, a, um, a prophecy fulfilled. Isaiah said that this was coming. With the Messiah would come this kind of thing. It says in Isaiah 35, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer. I love that. Tongues who are mute will sing for joy. 
waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. I love that. See, God is an enemy of suffering, so we are too. Miracles take place in the lives of people. When we love them, our love validates then the message that brings about miracles in the hearts of people. Look at verse 9. And the people saw that he was walking and praising God. And they knew this was the guy from the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were all filled with amazement, and they gathered around. And then it says that they started to cling to Peter and to John. And then Peter, I don't know, I mean, that's kind of funny. Like, he's clinging literally. And Peter's like, hey, bro, well, you know, like, hey, listen, this was not us, man. This is not us. We didn't do this. Why are y'all gathering around for us? This is because of Jesus. What's happened? Jesus did this. And so what he does, he enters into a... He immediately starts preaching the gospel. Basically, he says in verse 12, he says, hey, men of Israel, why do you wonder and stare at us as though by our own power or piety, we're, we're making this thing happen? This is not what happened here. Jesus did this. And then he enters into what's really a three-point sermon, but he starts it this way. Hey, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of your fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered, you delivered him over. And you denied him in the presence of Pilate. Here's his message over the next many verses to the end. Here's a three-point message, like any good preacher, right? And here it is. Jesus came. You killed him. Repent. That's the message. And that's our message today. This is true of all of us. Jesus came, the author of life, and he has come because our sin has placed him on the cross. He did it volitionally. He did it out of love for us. But it's because of our sin. He took it upon himself, the author of life, he calls him. In verse 15, 16. And then he says, repent. Look at verse 19. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Look at this. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you. I love this. See, we often think of repentance, somebody on the corner yelling, screaming, repent, repent, you know, and it's, yeah, we're, we're ashamed of our sin, but look, it's all so that he can bring life to you today, and so as we close our time together, I just, I think this is for all of us. Here's what the Spirit of God is doing among us. He's saying, I want you to stop. I want you to look at your life. Look at the mess that you've made of your life. Look at areas of your life that are not fully devoted to me. And I want you to listen. Listen to the Spirit of God and what he's saying to you. And he's calling you to repentance. He's calling you to give your life over to him. Every single one of us. It was Luther who said that the Christian life is one of constant, perpetual repentance. Because it's through repentance. Did you catch that? That life comes. It's through repentance of sin. In verse 26, he said, God is having raised up his servant, sent him to you first. To bless you by turning every one of you away from your wickedness. The gospel is good news. And it is a blessing. But it begins when we repent of our sin. So I want us to pray together as we close our time. I want you to just bow your head. Close your eyes right where you are. And I know the Spirit has spoken to us today. People in your life who you know. uh, Maybe it's a spouse. It may be someone you know very well. And they're hurting. And you've not stopped. You've not really looked. You've not listened. Repent and change. Others of you know people in your life, in the workplace, in your classroom, in your work, in your in your your neighborhood, and they are hurting. You've not stopped. You haven't been looking, and you're not listening. Repent. And for all of us here, if you've never received Christ, today is your day right now. He says, stop trying to run your own life. Look at the mess that you've made. Repent. Listen to the Spirit of God who loves you, who's calling you to himself right now. Receive him by faith. Receive his grace right now. Say yes to him and follow him as your rabbi till the day you die. Lord, we give you our lives. We love you. We commit ourselves fully to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.